thank you so much, Christel. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Crystal also for inviting me um, and for organizing this round table. I would say that thanks to her, we uh, can look ahead at a wonderful day uh, with a truly stellar group of speakers um, who are going to offer us a real uh, tour d'horizon uh, of what better regulation could mean or already means in a wide range of different subfields of private law. So thank you, Crystal, for making this, uh, uh, this all possible. Now, Crystal asked me to speak briefly, briefly, um, about the goals of European uh, private law. Um, what does the European Union aim at when it is active in this field? Um, and that's, of course, a very important question and one that logically precedes uh, the topic of better regulation itself. Um, it does not need much explanation that you must first know which aims to achieve before we are able to reflect upon how to achieve um, those aims uh, through whatever type of legislation or regulation. So I will try to reflect a bit upon these, uh, uh, these aims of European private law uh, and will then go on to identify um, what I call three challenges uh, for European efforts to achieve better regulation in this field. Um, and although I do certainly not belong to that class of speakers um, or academics who see private law um, as a sacred and autonomous field, um, I will argue that private law is somewhat special. Um, in my view, it does differ from traditional regulatory fields, such as, I would say, social security law, um, or environmental law, or food safety, um, and that this has its bearing on the smart regulation agenda. By the way, we are talking about smart regulation. It's also in the title of our conference. Um, I think there was uh, just a few weeks ago, um, uh, mid-December 2012, uh, a new document of the European Commission where the term smart regulation seems to be traded in for um, uh, 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 regulatory fitness, um, which is a term that I uh, must say uh, <laughs> like a lot. Yeah. Um, there's one caveat uh, when I'm speaking. I am not standing here as an expert on regulation, um, but as someone who pretends to know something about private law or about <coughs> European private law. So I guess that the title of my talk could also have been um, a private lawyer looks at regulation. So what are the goals of European private law? Well, of course, the answer has to depend on what we mean by the term European private law. Um, I would not define European private law in a too limited way. One could claim that it is about the efforts um, of the European Union to create rules with relevance for private actors. And if you define it in such a broad way, we have many of such rules. Um, just to um, remind you of the fact that the first category would then consist of the well-known directives and regulations that any private lawyer would associate with European influence on national laws. Um, so that's legislation with relevance for contract law, um, mainly consumer law, with some relevance also for property law, uh, company law. This slide, that's a well-known overview, uh, that gives an overview of directives uh, with such relevance for private law in uh, general. Then, if you would go continue uh, using this very broad definition of European private law, you should say that next to this, we also have European legislation on liberalization of markets. Um, that would open up markets in areas like telecommunication, uh, like transport, um, like energy. And the aim of this type of legislation is indeed to break down state monopolies, leading to contracts becoming more important in setting uh, the rules that private actors are governed by, that they can create themselves. Related to this, I would say, is regulation on um, uh, capital markets, insurance, financial services, competition. As you can see, my broad definition allows me to get in a lot of different types of, uh, uh, of rules, um, product safety, food safety, and we will still hear about other examples later today. Now, these are all fields. Um, I think regulatory private law is the right term to use again. Uh, these are all fields that are often neglected by private lawyers um, in their efforts to describe 
what private law is actually um, about. And then finally, still as a third category uh, that would fit my broad definition of European private law, um, we should probably still mention the rules on private international law, such as the Robert Brussels regulations, providing rules on applicable law in contracts, in delictual liability, tort, as well as on jurisdiction, as recognition and enforcement of judgments. Okay, so um, having said all this, um, if this is what we mean by European private law, then what is its main aim? I don't think we need to look very far. Um, the overview I just gave is evidence of a great diversity of rules within the field of European private law, but almost all these rules are based um, on the idea, of course, that they will facilitate, one day or another, the completion of the internal market. I do not deny, of course, that there are many other sub-goals we can talk about, sub-goals also, also mentioned in the various legislative and regulatory instruments, um, sub-goals such as environmental protection, improvement of social standards, consumer protection, enhancement of competition, better access to justice, um, or the good functioning of civil procedure. Um, but I would say, I would argue these are at best, also in the view of the um, European legislature, uh, sub-goals of this overall aim. And when you think back of the list of directives I just showed you, in the general field of private law, um, they are, of course, almost all based on the competence created by Article 114 of the TFEU, meaning they are based on the internal market provision um, itself. Okay, let me now try to identify uh, three challenges that follow from the pursuit of um, this overall aim in the area of European private law. I would say the first challenge is a, a theoretical one and therefore one that should primarily be taken up by academics. The second one is a, what I would call a legal political challenge to be taken up by the lawgiver. And the third challenge is an empirical one, probably of reference both to lawgivers and to academics. And what I try to um, do today is more of a mapping um, exercise. Um, I'm not going to provide you with any answers um, or solutions to the challenges that I have, um, but it's much more mapping uh, at least the problems that I see, and no doubt there are many other problems as well, so we'll hear about that later on today. And my focus is um, on the core areas of, uh, uh, of private law. For, <coughs> sorry. First, <coughs> um, the theoretical challenge, challenge for um, academics, and it's formulated on the slide uh, in the form of a question. It is about what is the rise of the use of private law as a regulatory tool actually means for the conceptual foundations of the field. How does it change our understanding of private law? Now, as some of you may know, um, there is a continuing battle in particular in the Anglo-American literature on what is in fact the aim of private law. Um, and then on the one hand, we have theorists who seek to explain private law according to its own internal coherence, so on its own terms. And these authors argue that there is something like normative corrective justice that justifies the main core areas like contracts, torts, and justified enrichment and property without reference to any outside goals. Um, in particular, Ernest Weinrib from the University of Toronto um, is famous for having developed this idea in his book on the idea of private law, almost 20 years old, uh, 1995 is the year in which it was published. And to him, that's at least what he claims, to him, law is like, private law is like love or friendship um, in the sense that they can stand alone. They are not an instrument, not a tool to achieve any outside goal. They have their own autonomous reason for existence. Well, I'm not going to go too much into this. Weiner builds upon Aristotle and Kant, emphasizing that any given person is a self-determining agent who must respect the freedom of others. And when this right of others is breached, as in a tort case, the plaintiff suffers a loss and the defendant gains uh, a benefit and only a claim for damages 
is able to restore the equality between the parties. Now, the important thing about this, for the topic we are discussing today, is that any instrumentalist regulatory concern is something extrinsic to all this and should therefore not be seen as part of private law proper. Now, I must say, um, this may sound a bit like an esoteric theory to um, perhaps some of us, um, but I believe that what Weinrib does is only to provide foundations for a view of private law that is still very much alive uh, today. I would say the way in which most national private lawyers um, think about their field still fits in very well with what he is claiming. What influential doctrinalists, um, people doing uh, uh, further developing legal doctrine, um, are doing, and then you could mention people like uh, the late Peter Burks in the UK, um, Michael Martinek in Germany, Jacques Castel in France, what they do in their doctrinal uh, work is actually a search for internal coherence of private law, and it fits in perfectly well with this view that Weinrib has. Okay, on the other hand, this was one end of the uh, spectrum. On the other hand, we have colleagues who would primarily look at private law as an instrument. Um, it is there, indeed, to serve some external goal, a goal to be found in, for example, economic efficiency, wealth maximization, protection of the environment, facilitation of the market, uh, redistribution of wealth, social justice, and I could still go on. And as views may differ, of course, on which goal or combination of goals is best for society, we need democratic decision-making to decide upon, well, which goal is then best. I would say regulatory private law, to a large extent, fits in with this view. Now, what is the challenge that I promised to speak about? In my view, it's simply to find new foundations for private law that take both these dimensions into um, account. The problem is that national private law is usually seen as aiming for internal coherence, European private law as being regulatory, but the problem is they have different rationalities, general rules in the national systems that have come about in a long well, process reflecting probably some kind of national morality uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, rules suited to the rationality of the market. They may coincide in some cases, but often they do not. So the question remains how to relate the two to each other. Um, if you think of this also in terms of the textbooks that private lawyers use, uh, if you think of it in terms of academic discussion, there too we see that the two debates are too far um, apart. So should we try to find a new kind of internally coherent system that would accommodate both rationalities, or should the two remain apart? If you say regulatory goals can change quickly over time, this may call for uh, the latter. On the other hand, the influence of the European regulatory private law can sometimes have very surprising effects on national law. Thomas Wilhelmsson from Helsinki has called this, the, uh, in a famous uh, uh, way of saying it has called this the jack-in-the-box effect. Um, the effects of um, a regulatory uh, private law uh, or European private law rules issued by the European legislature can um, show up at the most unexpected places and then disturb this internally coherent system of private law that was there before. Um, so therefore, you may want to avoid this by trying to make the law more predictable, but then that would mean that you have to put both rationalities into one, well, let's say, system. So the question is, should we do that? And if so, how should we do it? Then I go on with my, briefly, with my two other um, challenges. Um, I think the second challenge that we have is, uh, uh, is addressed to the, uh, to the lawgiver in our case, both the European and the national legislatures, and to a lesser extent, the courts. Uh, the problem here is that European regulatory measures in private law always have to land in a, have to be applied in a multi-level system. Um, you may all know that in the core fields of private law I was talking about, or am talking about, that there the um, most used harmonization technique um, is still 
minimum harmonization. Um, um, that's perhaps no longer the preferred option of the European Commission, but it is the, well, most feasible option in view of the political uh, reality. But the problem is that it makes it difficult for the European lawgiver, lawgiver to achieve its goals in a straightforward way. It makes European market building dependent on the national jurisdictions that have to implement the European measures. Um, and there may even be uh, a paradox here. Um, if you look at all the documents on better regulation of the last um, uh, 10 years, um, if you start with the Mandelkern report of 2001, uh, and then go on until the most recent regulation and regulatory fitness of last year, they all emphasize the importance of achieving a simplified regulatory environment. Simplified regulatory environment. I would say in the core areas of private law, um, the very creation of European rules does not tend to simplify, but tends to complicate that legal um, environment. Arguably, there's empirical evidence for that, arguably business is after a legal environment that is as certain as possible. And making law at different levels does not really facilitate this. So in that sense, there's also uh, a concern with the optimal way of, um, uh, uh, of having uh, your ideal type of regulation in a multi-level system. Then challenge number three, uh, an empirical challenge. Um, of course, an essential, if not the essential element of the better lawmaking agenda of the Commission consists of the consistent use of impact assessments. Um, the European legislature is to provide evidence on the future effects of policy choices. Um, so in the main areas um, that I discussed today, if the European Commission wants to introduce new legislative measures, it has to demonstrate that the present situation of, say, diverse laws would be detrimental to the internal market and that the proposed measure is going to change this. Now, if one has a closer look, close look at the impact assessment, um, it shows that it's often problematic to say something sensible about the effects of law on economic performance. Um, I would, for example, in the case of the directives I showed you, I would, for example, need to prove a positive relationship uh, between legal harmonization and an increase in cross-border trade. The recent proposal for a common European sales law, that I think you have all heard about, um, is uh, a good example of this. Because in the proposal, the European Commission uh, tries to make empirical claims about the effects of diverse laws on cross-border trade based on the Eurobarometer surveys. Um, well, in fact, that is highly uh, debated. There was a very nice conference in Chicago. Uh, Fabrizio was also present there, uh, a conference in Chicago uh, uh, last year, where we had an American uh, colleague, uh, Bill Hubbard, who wrote, I must say, a wonderful paper, also available on, uh, on SSRN, where he, uh, the paper is called Another Look at the Eurobarometer Surveys. Um, and his claim is that what the European Commission is doing um, is actually uh, not supported by these, uh, by these surveys. And if I quote from the abstract of the paper, it says, well, a closer look at these surveys reveals that the cited statistics cited by the Commission um, do not support the claims that contract law related obstacles present special barriers to cross-border trade for small and medium-sized enterprises and uh, consumers. It's really worth uh, reading this paper. Um, I will still take uh, two to three minutes or so. Um, but I do believe, I just mentioned the Common European Sales Law, which is an optional or proposed as an optional instrument, meaning that uh, individual contracting parties could choose for it. Um, I do believe that that is actually a very attractive um, course to take. I do believe that the European Commission, uh, in its efforts to move more towards the use of these optional instruments, uh, is, uh, well, is doing a good thing. What I like about it, again, when you talk about uh, the regulatory environment, what I like about it is that optional European rules to be chosen by market actors, um, that that provides an empirical method of establishing the need for uniform laws. If parties choose it, that's fine. If they don't, that's fine as well. 
uh, because in that case, parties apparently do not see the need for making use of such a set of European uh, rules. Now, I do realize that may not work in all fields, but I guess it does work in many areas based on the, well, where the autonomy of parties plays an important role, as in uh, private law. <coughs> so I'd like to make a plea in the end for these kinds of more experimental um, methods. Uh, and it would in any event be very good if the European Commission would see the whole range of regulatory or legislative um, options, because I sometimes have the feeling that the existence of different DTs does stand in the way of this more um, open, uh, open mind. Now here I have to stop, uh, because I promised I would not speak for more than 15 minutes, and I guess I already exceeded that. Um, as I said in the beginning, this may have been more uh, a, of a view from private law than a view from the perspective of regulation. Um, but I hope that's also justified in a round table uh, like this. Thank you very much.